Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Harvard. Um, thank you to uh, the citizens and the, uh, of, of, the, of the city for inviting us here. And I'm going to present to you a not as rapid pace as, uh, as the last presentation. Um, the, the title of my talk is Touching the Ground Lightly. Ted Happold, the founder of Bureau Happold, was a professor of architecture and engineering at Bath University. Um, he took on that role in 1976. And before sustainability, the, the term was ever coined, uh, Ted's view was that actually we as professionals had a duty to, to minimize the impact that we made on the Earth's surface. <clears throat> we work around the world. Um, we're part of a larger organization, Bureau Happold. Bureau Happold employs about 2,000 people and it is in about, uh, got about 25 offices and, and they work in about 70 countries. Happold Consulting was founded in, nine, in 2006 and its footprint is not quite so large, uh, but we do work in a very large number of places and we operate from offices in London, New York and in Riyadh in the Middle East. Um, we, again, the approach here is because we're dealing with very complex issues that require an understanding of many, very many different areas, we employ um, people like economists, business consultants, strategy, uh, environment, climate change, social sciences, planning, design, etc., etc. So we believe that to address these complex issues, you need a complex set of, of, of skills. The question that when I set up the business in, 90, in 2006 was, why do so many projects failed? A sort of a non-scientific research by me uh, would indicate something of the order of 95% of all urban interventions fail. It doesn't mean they don't achieve anything, but they fail to achieve what they set out to achieve. And I started to investigate why that was, and I found four areas of, or sorry, three areas of, of significant deficit. One was in relation to planning. It's there's a failure to take into account the economic, social, political, environmental, and spatial infrastructure factors necessary to shape an overall project. And then on the organization side, what, again going back, what I found was about that 95% that failed, about 50% of them failed because the wrong solutions were being put in place. The other 50% failed because the, the delivery organizations didn't have the skill sets, the resources, et cetera. So it didn't have the structure, the staff, the skills, capabilities, et cetera, to actually support the development. And the last one was about the, they didn't, oftentimes the client organization or the key, key delivery partners didn't have the, the business planning skills, the access to funding or the ability to, to raise finance. And, you know, those of you who are familiar with what happened in Dubai and Las Vegas and many other places will see that too many projects started with a, with a drawn spatial vision before there was a clear understanding. And much of that was driven by, by uh, ramping up the market and that sort of stuff is unsustainable. And, and, you know, I think for those of us who are concerned about, about sustainable development, the, the, you know, the, the faster that bubble burst, the better. Um, so how can we, you know, relate that back to the Exumas? Well, nobody's quite defined exactly the problem. I've tried to define it. Um, it. It's defining the quantum scale and type of development that meets the development objectives while safeguarding the natural environment and socio-economic balance it supports. That's a long, a long-winded statement. I'm sure we can all do better than that if, if uh, this project goes forward. But essentially, what I'm trying to say is that you need to have a sort of balance there. And, and the key questions for the Exumas are, is there a shared vision? Because if there's not, there needs to be. Um, what type and scale of development is demanded? Demanded by, and I suppose you could say demanded by whom? What type and scale of development can be supported? Um, what development in the Exumas will be synergetic with the rest of the Bahamas? And what value will it bring, will development bring? We heard some interesting comments on, on that earlier. And what is needed to ensure that sustainable development happens? So understanding all these requires uh, an integrated, logical, and we would say evidence-based approach. Okay, we call this our angel diagram. It's the name we give to it. And really this is about, it's, it's, it's sort, of, sort of the structure that we follow when we do these sort of scalar projects. The first bit, and again, it came back to, uh, that comes back to, to uh, comments made by our local architect. You know, you need to listen and learn in many ways from actually what exists here. And Aspira also talked about that. 
looking at a vision. I think you need to put, get a vision in place very early, even though that, that vision will be amended. And then you need to look at the demand side. And again, Professor uh, Thomas Hope sort of talked about this. You need to look at demand parameters. This is about markets and economy, about population and demographics, living standards. And on the capacity constraint side, on the right-hand side, you'll see it's about environment, community, social, land ownership, legal, governance, etc. Bringing those two things together, you're getting a demand-led uh, which is the potential that the market would could support and then the carrying capacity again that was a very interesting sort of comment but again it's interesting to hear other people reinforce our prejudices or whatever but you know there's a maximum development that a particular project could sustain bringing that together into a development pr planning framework and then you use that to test options and there's a series of different sort of tests which one would apply, but I'll show you one particular aspect of that in a moment. Um, and then from that, you, you determine a, the preferred option. And then there are four components that, are, in my opinion, you, you, you need. One of them is a master plan, the spatial plan. There's a socioeconomic plan as necessary, a governance plan, because of the, the points I mentioned earlier, and an implement, implementation plan, because so many projects fail through lack of implementation. I won't dwell on this one, that looks at that in a bit more detail. And now look at why model? Well, we've all come across the standard approach to planning. You've got option A, B, and C. Well, option, uh, the preferred option might be option C, but A and B is done, and, but option C it always looks much better, and the client generally choose option C. And, uh, but actually, option C doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It generally is not rigorously tested. So the idea of preparing a parametric model here is to look at, as I explained earlier today, look at the, the perhaps 10, 15 most important variables, parameters, and model those parameters to truly understand potentially hundreds of variants that you could possibly do, and modern technologies that can allow you to do that. You can prepare parametric, par parametric models. So basically, what the modeling can do, it will understand the complex and simplify the complicated. Um, you can embrace complexity because the problems are very complex. Um, it can identify patterns which are not easy for the, the eye to see and it enables you to visualize and, and, and share that information to enable a robust decision-making process. Now I'm going to look at a series of, uh, of projects. This one is uh, uh, Sabal Ahmed, C-City in Kuwait. The, the thing about uh, Kuwaitis, Kuwaitis, um, they're a nomadic people in many ways, but actually they love to have a place by the sea. Um, and even actually for people of modest means, they like to have a place by the sea. But actually that coastline is very valuable. There's not enough of it around. And you'll see here, um, I don't know if you can see here, you see how people have actually built along by the coastline. This is 70 kilometers south of Kuwait City. This is quite a nice area, but this is, this is what this area was like before we, um, before we looked at it. Um, the client asked us to try to find a site of the lowest possible environmental value because the client was looking for, looking to enhance the environmental value actually through the development process, not actually to mitigate uh, impacts, but to actually, to, to actually increase its, its environmental value. And the, the reason that this particular site was chosen, this, the land here was within about uh, one to two meters of sea level, and it was Sabka. Sabka is salt and sand. It's virtually inert. There is n virtually no life can live there. So it's a very poor environment. So we, we, we selected this site, and through a, a rigorous planning process, hydraulic modeling, et cetera, et cetera, we, we actually took the sea in rather than building out because actually that land, we were able to take that land, we were able to uh, create navigable waterways because remember, what they're looking for is the people want to live by the sea. So you, you're trying to create the, and maximize the, the length of coastline available. And so we didn't do the Dubai style, the Dubai palm style, and that, that, that has done incredible damage to the environment. Um, we employed a, a leading environmental scientist to guide and advise the team and we performed environmental modeling all the way through the project. And it's quite interesting, and you'll see in a moment, the, we attracted species, both flora and fauna, to this particular project that had been dying out elsewhere in the region. And you'll see over 80 fish, fish has been attracted into this uh, development. 
and the waterways act as the spawning grounds for this uh, uh, new. So this is a, is a site which I think on on both sci on scientific research has actually the environment has been significantly enhanced by development. Now all of the other things I'm not talking about engineering here, but all of the other engineering systems they all had to be there. We you know we, one couldn't discharge sort of uh, effluent treated sewage effluent and that sort of stuff. One couldn't discharge that into the waterways, and, we, and there's a very important management plan operation plan in place. Another project here, and you'll see there's a sort of theme to some of our projects. Um, this is about environmental restoration. This project is a 140 kilometer wadi running to the west of the Riyadh city, the capital city of Saudi Arabia. And <clears throat> for more than 30 years, uh, sewage was discharged into the wadi. Um, you had gravel extraction, um, you had garbage dumping and construction waste. Um, and the f natural flood channel, which actually is essential in a river valley or, or a wadi, as they call it in, in, uh, in the Middle East, um, it, it was interrupted and you got uh, a lot of flooding and many people were killed there. So the natural environment was seriously damaged and, and compromised. This is an example. This is on the top left-hand corner, you'll see growth of Phragmites. Phragmites is what happens when you get over-enrichment of the environment. And here, gravel extraction that you see here on the right-hand side, and you can see construction plant and equipment. So a dreadful mess. And this was back in, in uh, 2002. And over the next set of eight years or so, uh, the project was restored, the environment restored, and we prepared an, a, an environmental master plan, implementation plan, and a management plan. And this won the Aga Khan Award as a project of outstanding uh, rehabilitation of a damaged environment. And it's, it's incredibly popular. Uh, this uh, project has attracted one million visitors in its first six months of opening in a city of approximately 4.5 million. Another project is just starting actually right now and in some respects has uh, some uh, parallels with the Exomas. This is theoretically an eco city, but really is not. Once we delved, the client had actually titled it an eco city, but in reality, it's much more about social than it is about, uh, about uh, environment. And the Latvian economy suffered really badly. One of the, one of the worst economies uh, to suffer after the, in the recession of 2008. And many people immigrated. And our client wants to develop an eco city that can sort of help to revive the economy and, and boost the social uh, and human capital in the country. So it's a, it's a project driven by, a, with a social dimension as opposed to an, uh, an environmental one. And, and perhaps when we look at the Exumas, there are, there are elements to, to maybe focus on some of these things. <clears throat> and so the developer would need to address that, um, the triple bottom line of social, environmental, and economic, probably in that order. And so the first stage is actually to identify what could a viable economy be? And that's one of the things I think, you know, uh, uh, the Bahamas is actually is a, is, a, is, a, is a country that actually is highly dependent on tourism. Perhaps you need to think about diversification. And so for us, thinking about what a viable economy would be was the starting point. We haven't quite reached there yet. We're about two months into, into the project. It's a, it's a very interesting, we have identified a series of, of, of businesses based upon the environment based upon actually using its natural assets. And then we will prepare a master plan, a business plan, an implementation plan, etc. All that sort of stuff will come. But a fundamental part of what we're doing is actually the communication. We talked about that. The, we have had many, many meetings with every, everybody from the prime minister down to sort of the local people in the community. They've all been participating and we're in the first two months of the project. And they're in there not in a formal consultation uh, mechanism, but an informal one. They're being consulted as part of that exercise. Um, this is uh, Taif, the summer capital of, of Saudi Arabia. Um, Taif is, is um, it's a lot cooler than, than, um, than the country as a whole. It's higher altitude and it's got some beautiful landscapes. And it's a magnet for both internal tourism within Saudi Arabia and the, and the wider region. However, as it often happens in, 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 in places like this, regulation and governance is very poor and um, the environment is under real pressure. And the challenge is how to maximize the tourism industry because tourism is a very important part of that without damaging its main asset. And that's a, that is a real challenge. And this is what happens when it goes wrong. This is a road that was built actually across the other side of that hill that I showed you earlier. And you can see the damage, the spoil, the, the construction spoil. 
That is a sort of thing that can happen. What we've been asked to do is to try and prepare a plan that will help to ensure that that sort of thing never happens again. This was built about uh, six or seven years ago. And you can see the, the environment has been completely destroyed. Looking at another one, this is uh, in Jeddah. Jeddah is, is located on the Red Sea, coast of Saudi Arabia. It's got a population of 3.4 million, and 40% of the, um, the population is living in informal settlements or sometimes termed slums. It may not be the slums of India, but it's certainly informal settlements. And the city has served by, by less than 50% of it with a sewage network and direct discharges to the Red Sea uh, of sewage, similar to what happened, I think, here. But your, your populations are much smaller. A lot of damage has been done uh, to, the, to the coral. Coral has got fantastic, the Red Sea has got fantastic coral, um, both on the Egyptian side and the Saudi side. And the nearshore environment is under real, real pressure. Our work was primarily an urban, urban one, but actually but because the coastal area is so significant to the whole city that the coastal became a significant part of that. And so we prepared a 20-year strategic plan to guide that development. It focused mainly, as I say, on the urban area, but uh, the plan has, uh, and again, the important thing is preparing plans which sit on shelves is not what we should be doing. It should be action-oriented. There should be a series of initiatives. There should be any plan that is prepared needs to, needs to have both a long-term frame, I think, and a short-term one, because politicians, need to achieve success. Politicians need to demonstrate that. And we as professionals, I think, need to understand that if we can't deliver the short-term uh, successes for the politicians, the longer-term ones will also elude. This is another project in Croatia. This was built, this was being planned at the same time as Dubai and many other projects like it. Much of the southern part of Croatia was depopulated, uh, has become depopulated over the last uh, 20, 30 years. And that, that uh, depopulation accelerated during the Balkans War of the 1990s. But tourism is one of the main attractions uh, for uh, Croatia, one of the main earners. It's got a wonderful city of Dubrovnik, you probably know it, and it's got fantastic landscape. In fact, there are so many parallels between Croatia, really, and, and Bahamas, because it's got fantastic islands. The elevation is a bit higher, but it's, 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 it's beautiful. So uh, our client, with government support, um, was wanted to actually explore building a semi-urban area to both uh, further attract tourism and create other industries. And the question we ask is, can tourism coexist in a fragile environment? Because we heard, we heard about the, the, the stats this morning. So <clears throat> the client needed a master plan. This is very common. This is, very, this is a developer. He needed a master plan to attract uh, to get the support of government, to engage with the wider development community, the funders, et cetera, and potential purchases. There were many failed attempts. This was, the, this was a classic project, actually. Many of the architects, I shan't mention their names, but many, many very famous architects came into this project, produced a master plan, worked for six months, and the project, and, the, and, it, and it failed. It failed because they were misconceived. It failed because, uh, you know, we were advising the client. And we advised the client very strongly that he had to understand what the, what the land was telling him. But he didn't do that. Anyway, we resigned from the project because we, 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 we believed that it was impossible to, to deliver a project. And non, unsurprisingly, the project failed um, in 2008. This project is an interesting one. This project was commented earlier uh, on um, by our colleagues from, from New York. This is Jamaica Bay. Jamaica Bay is a very damaged environment. Um, it's been partly to build JFK. They took the, the sand out, out, of the, out of this area and, and raised the land to, to build the JFK airport. Uh, the other issue is there, there's some massive uh, pollution, and, uh, and I'll show you this here now. There's some massive pollution around it. There was uh, backfilling, um, sewers, etc. And the total marsh area from 1951 has reduced from 950 acres down to three, in 2003, 355 acres. So, the Corps of Engineers are involved in, at this point in time, a massive exercise in environmental rehabilitation, very similar to what needs to be done actually on the southern coast of the United States uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but unlike Central Park, the Jamaica Bay is unloved. Nobody really knows about it because it's actually it's a wasteland. The New York police use it for, for target training. They use it for, for cars. They use it to dump cars that are unclaimed. It's a, a total and utter mess. And 
And also the other, the other issue which we need to understand is that the governance is divided between the National Parks Authority and the city. So nobody really owns it, and that's a big issue. So the green here shows the extent of the wetlands back in 1950s, okay? And you can see the wetlands here. So even if you get a damaged environment like this, it is possible, it's very expensive to restore. But this work is going on right now in terms of the restoration. But some crucial bits have not been thought about. The physical environment is actually is under restoration. How to engage with the sorting out the governance has not really been thought about. So actually, so even though substantial areas have been restored, the governance issue has not been addressed, and therefore the the park is continuing to fail. And the other issue is the around the Jamaica Bay area is it's a quite a poor neighborhood, and there is no relationship between the park, between the bay and the, the surrounding neighborhood. They don't own it, they don't feel they own it. it they, don't, they don't value it. And that's the other part. We talked about consultation earlier and how you have to engage. So in a way, we are doing a sort of retrofit on the issues that haven't been addressed. The environmental, the physical aspects have been addressed, but the, the cru crucial aspects have not been addressed. And that's what we're doing right now. We talked earlier about, about codes and standards, and I'm slightly skeptical of of uh, you know rating systems and what they do. I think LEED, BREEAM, they have done an enormous amount of good because they help to raise awareness. I think using them now for 10 years as we've done, I think we also see the limitations of those and we see the fact that they cannot be applied across the world. The, the, the circumstances in the Bahamas are very different to the circumstances in the United States. And actually, and if you use it slavishly, you can quite easily uh, do the wrong things, do completely unsustainable things. So whilst they're well-intentioned, this one was an interesting one that we've been involved in developing for Abu Dhabi, and this is one that is absolutely very specific. It's actually tied very much to the, the Urban Planning Council's Vision 2030. It's, it's, it's tied very much into the culture of the city, into its institutions, and it's attempting to address environment, economic, and social cultural issues, but also the process and how projects are delivered. So it's actually, it's, it's much more expansive than what it is, and it's definitely, this could never be applied anywhere else. It is totally, totally place-focused. So, uh, I'm coming to an end, and I think I'm maybe running over my time, but, uh, um, so what are the clear lessons from such a diverse range of projects? Well, sustainability is decided in context. It's, it is location and time dependent. And I do say time, time is important because what is sustainable today will not be sustainable in five years from now. We'll have inevitably raised the bar. I hope we'll have raised the bar. And if, if the past 10 years didn't go by, that's what's gonna happen. Social and economic factors are, are, are as important as economic, uh, sorry, as, as environmental ones. There needs to be a shared vision. We need to rank the priorities. We can't give everything equal priority because we can't deliver. Ecosystem and environments are dynamic, and somebody mentioned that this morning. There are very few uh, truly natural environments still existing. I think the Exumas is probably one of those that is, but actually, but very few landscapes are continually evolving, and we need to process to manage evolving landscapes. What pays for sustainable development? Uh, we talked about Schooner Bay, and we talked about actually how the developer recognized within Schooner Bay that actually that some undiscovered aspects were actually part of, uh, part of the, uh, the value in the development. But actually, more, more often than not, sustainability is seen as a liability, and that's why actually a lot of the time it gets thrown out in the early stages of a pr planning of a project. If it's fundamental to the value, and it is properly valued, and that's the, the environmental asset is properly valued, I think it can, be, it can have a chance to go forward. And the vision can only be, in, in play, be put in place if the institutional capacity is there. So, we leave the questions, I think, till later. That's for me. Thank you.